Are we streaming it live or just recording it? Live. Who's watching? Well, Will is in charge of social media, so all of his followers. All of our people will watch it. All right. It's a new test for us. Good morning. Morning, morning, morning. Um, can you hear me at the back? Let's see, there we go. There's open seats up front, people. Yes, don't be shy. Come closer. All right. Uh, how's everybody doing this morning? Excellent. Uh, hopefully, it wasn't too late in evening for uh, everyone. Um, I will say the Alberta crew uh, kept uh, some of us out after the dinner a little later than others. Um, so if uh, my voice sounds worse uh, than maybe it should for how much I've talked already, um, that we can have that to blame. So welcome to our in the Valley. Um, this is uh, going to be a very different day than, uh, than yesterday. There's a lot, uh, lot, more, lot more going on. So I wanted to spend a few minutes uh, before we sort of kick off the speakers, talk to the team. Uh, we'll post them all up on the site. It's sort of a nice thing we like to do, but you'll be surprised. All, all of my uh, bio photos and everything, they're all 48 hours photos, so they come in handy over, over the years. Um, and uh, I've been doing this long enough, uh, my haircut's changed uh, over the time. Um, I want to thank BDC and KPMG and RBC and Rogers for the dinners last night. Did everybody enjoy, everybody enjoyed dinner? Good, yes, all right. Um, especially the BDC guys who left uh, extra bottles of wine on the table, which is why the Alberta crew and I were out later than I thought. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, but uh, today's host is Coolies. We're going to hear from them in a little bit, uh, but a big pre-thank you uh, to Coolies for again uh, hosting 48 Hours, which is, uh, which is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, so a few things on the logistics for the day. So we have some awesome speakers uh, this morning. Um, Chris, who's going to come up next, and Sikinder, um, uh, Eric, and then a panel led by uh, Lars uh, Lecky. Um, really a lot more insight into the Valley, a little bit of insight and in leading an organization, a bit of insight into building uh, great products, and then uh, the round table led by Lars is uh, sort of CFO focused all sort of big topics for anybody um, uh, as you grow your company. Uh, so definitely, um, uh, hopefully stay uh, uh, for all of those, a uh, good opportunity to ask some uh, sort of key questions. Um, so it's sort of vote with your feet, I think, on the tables, or is there a sign? There's a sign. Oh, it's a sign? Oh, no, there's a sign. On there the is a sign, but they are not assigned. Not there you go, just to confuse everyone. Um, and then at 1.30, we're going, the, the round tables will go to 1.30, and then at 1.30 we're going to start the afternoon, which are the VC meetings. And so I did want to take just a second to talk about that, a little bit of uh, just personal advice from how I've seen this go down in, in previous years. So the first thing to know, there'll be a table over here in the cafeteria. It's like your help desk uh, for the meetings. So if anything changes, if you have any questions, um, the, Joanne and company will be manning that desk. Um, for this in the uh, in the afternoon the meetings you are going to there's a schedule laid out on the table um, everyone will be uh, sort of finding out the details of those meetings we made a couple of changes all the meetings are here in the building so thanks to the team for working that out um, which is actually hard to do wrangling people's schedules last year we had people going uh, to places it was a bit of an amazing race situation some people made it some people didn't um, it's uh, so uh, we've, we've done away with that, uh, so it, you don't have to go anywhere. But I will say, um, they are real meetings. Okay, so the, the one piece of advice I would give is, uh, if you're gonna walk into these meetings sort of uh, overly casually, um, you are both an opportunity to practice and missing an opportunity to perhaps um, meet a pretty valuable member in your network going forward. So I would recommend, go find out who you're meeting. There's this awesome thing called the web where you can find out stuff about the person you're meeting with uh, and a little bit about the company they're with, their, their investment thesis. And even if it's not a perfect fit, this is an opportunity to give your pitch, get feedback, 
uh, from an investor uh, and ask some questions. But I would go into every meeting with an ask, right? Like do your pitch, have the meeting, but be very clear that those people are probably gonna say, how can I help? And that is a very genuine uh, rec uh, ask of you. And if you say, I don't know, um, then that's an, everybody's hour is kind of wasted. So I will just say, take the onus on yourself to prep for that meeting. Grip, like, that change. All right, good, we excited? All right, good. Um, so let's, uh, let's get on with it. So first, uh, I'd like to invite Kevin, got a ton of here in the companies, um, get us started and then I'll introduce Chris. So Kevin. Not one, is this on? Welcome everybody. Um, happy to have you here at Cooley and uh, Pleasure to have all of you here. Unfortunately, I couldn't make yesterday, um, so I didn't have a chance to meet you then, but I look forward to meeting all of you or as many of you as I can today. In terms of background, uh, I'm Canadian, uh, Waterloo engineering grad, and then went on to become a lawyer and went to Dalhousie Law School, worked in 2000. So as Mark said, I, I focus on technology companies, been with companies here in the Valley uh, for about 15 years now. My practice is uh, mostly company side, although I do represent uh, about a dozen or so VC firms as well, and then a handful of incubators and accelerators uh, locally that work with uh, technology companies. And just to tell you a little bit about Cooley, we're, we're, we're not a venture firm. Some, some folks last year got us confused with a, a VC firm. We're, we're a law firm. Uh, we're a big law firm. We're 850 lawyers now in 12 offices, 10 in the US, and two, uh, one in China, one in London to abroad. And what differs, uh, uh, well, how we differ from what you might be used to in working with law firms in Canada is there's no real firm like Cooley in Canada. The difference is that we're entirely focused on startups, uh, or we call emerging growth companies. And what we like to do is, is form those companies and then follow those companies all the way through their life cycle. Uh, and what that, what that means is we've built practice areas around the firm, including IP, employment, technology licensing, uh, labor, litigation, all of those types of things uh, to support companies like yours as you grow. And just to translate that into metrics, uh, our metrics, right now I think we have over 5,000 private companies. Last year we did 540 reportable VC transactions, so VC investments, um, 150 transactions. And and we have about 350 VC fund clients and last year formed 174 new VC funds for either new fund clients or existing fund clients. And rank currently number one in capital markets, number one in VC financings, and we think number one in terms of size of uh, early stage practice. Um, I work with a number of Canadian companies and what I mostly do is just act as an extension of your legal team down here in the US and we help with introductions, we help with structuring transactions, partnerships, uh, negotiating venture deals, um, or the benefit someone like us who the VCs here know, if we're involved then there's going to be probably a, a likelihood that you're maybe prepared, at least in their eyes, of how we do deals down here. Without trying to, to follow up with later, meet as many people, tell your story to as many people as will listen, frankly. Um, that's the opportunity, it's a great one. So, have a great time, thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Um, all right, so we're gonna get started. So, uh, I said one thing to you yesterday. How many people spent some time with someone they didn't know yesterday? Ah, oh, so you're doing it right. So keep doing it right today. Uh, don't make me have to come find you um, on that point. So while the VC meetings are going on, this room will be available. Um, VC here, oh, the space fine. will be available. Yeah. My point is um, there's a bit of downtime between meetings. It's a great opportunity to grab. There's other C100 members uh, not in the VC meetings, you know, myself and others uh, happy to sit down. So it's a good opportunity this afternoon to use that time, uh, but also if you need to, to do some work. Uh, Wi-Fi is up on the wall, um, and uh, if you need anything, certainly just, um, is Chris Albinson. Um, there's a couple of things you need to know about Chris. One, his title is he's co-founder and managing director of Founder Circle Capital. 
Um, but the more important thing is all of this uh, wouldn't actually be here if it wasn't for him and a few others. So uh, what's that? Anthony. And Anthony, um, uh, the original founders of the, the C100. Um, uh, proud Canadian, uh, crazy connected guy, awesome storyteller. And uh, uh, I'm pretty excited to hear what he has to say uh, to you guys this morning. Uh, good guy uh, whose uh, brain you should try and pick. He's going to share a little bit of uh, his insights uh, with you this morning. I'm not, not going to say anything else about Chris. I'll let him do that himself. A big round of applause for Chris, please. Meetings, and so that's awesome that he did that. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why he's such a valuable member of our community. So again, Kevin, thanks for setting those meetings up because he may have just gotten you the relationship that leads to the financing that meets the person that really helps you drive your business. So, you know, big hand to uh, Kevin. Thanks for doing that. Cool. Okay, so um, how much time do I have? Half an hour. Half an hour, wow. Okay, we're gonna go super fast. And I'm told that if I stand up there, I have half the Canadian flag on my head. So I'm gonna like try to stand down here. So do you, do you want, can I borrow somebody just to push slides for yep. me? Yep. Awesome, yep. thanks man. Appreciate it. So I'll give you like one of those. Cool. All right. What I wanted them all, but um, one's kind of important. The 0.3%. Uh, there's also. If we don't cover everything, or if there's something that you want to talk about. So, all right. Cool. Um, you need to take the word sorry, which is a cherished word in Canadian speak, and use it effectively, but not do the, I have a startup idea, sorry. It might be interesting, sorry. It may or may not be something interesting, sorry. You know, and we need to kind of like get that out of the way. And most of you guys are like 90% there, like you're not doing that anymore, but there's still 10%. You don't even realize it. It's been ingrained in you by your mother for 30 years, and so it seeps out every once in a while. And there's a beautiful part about being Canadian and the humility and the trust that you engender. Uh, but there's also another side of that, and I want to talk about it a little bit and see if I can knock it out of you before you do your venture meetings this afternoon. Um, does anyone know who that is in the top there, that guy there? Right, so it's Drew, uh, founder of Dropbox. And Drew talked about something that really made a lot of sense to me. I had uh, four startups and I started two venture firms. Uh, and Drew basically said like, people talk about like doing your startup because you're passionate about it. And it actually turns out to be complete bullshit. Um, because the passion thing isn't really a real thing if you really drive your startup. There's another thing, and I'm not sure where it comes from, and only Drew has described it in a way that actually makes sense to me, having done a bunch of these, and he calls it the dog ball, right? And that's my dog up on our lake up in Ontario, and that was a soccer ball that she absolutely destroyed. And you could kick that thing for an entire day, and she would go grab it again and again and again and again, and there was a joy and a passion to it, but like, nutty, psychotic thing about I have to get that ball every goddamn time. And that's what it takes to build an amazing startup, in my experience. That passion, that directedness, that psychotic, I am going to go get this done every single time and to do it over and over and over and over again until it's perfect, that's what it takes. So that's one of the things uh, I was hoping to chat with you guys about. I'm gonna go through this super fast. One of the coolest things about being a startup founder right now is like you have the best platform in the history of technology right now to do startups. Like when I did my four startups, it was effing hard, right? You had, we had to raise like hundreds of millions of dollars. We had hundreds of engineers to build something to a billion dollars in revenue and we did it twice. Um, you can do that so much faster with less money in much more focused way and completely globally today than we've ever seen before. So that's cool. Um, does anyone know who that picture of that guy is? Okay, he's the guy who like figured out this thing called the internet, uh, Vint Cerf. 
Um, he, uh, he's the platform around which we've all built amazing careers and uh, businesses, and Vint was uh, advisor to my last startup. Uh, he started this thing called the Internet in 1974. Four computers connected between Stanford and UCLA, um, and uh, there were about seven people connected. Why do I bring that up? Because if you look at the, uh, the crash, I had two of my startups go through crashes. You know, I, it was really fun to hire a thousand people. It was really sucky to lay off 800. Um, but like building at growth and all of these scenarios took in their SMS. Uh, guys that did it before. Uh, and it at the same time, cool because you can kill record labels kind of print. Done. Thanks, keep going. Lots of people make money, big happen all the time. So and he's very on the problem, uh, and believe it or not, it is a problem of how you grow from 40 million to 400 million. Uh, of the four startups I had, I had a good fortune to be involved in two, um, and it is an amazing blessing to be in companies that are of that size and that growth. It is also the most challenging management experience I've ever had to try to grow at scale, and it's gotten a lot worse. If you look at the SaaS companies, uh, that get to 50 million in revenue, they're getting there in half the time years ago. That means you have that much stuff, more stuff to figure out in a much shorter period of time. Cool thing is, uh, which I think is the most amazing thing for you guys as entrepreneurs in this environment, is if you can get from A to B in half the time and half the dollars, you own 10 times the company, 2%. Netscape when it went public, Reed Hoffman owned 20% of LinkedIn when it went public. Uh, the localization of wealth, the amount of wealth that can be created from your efforts for your team uh, is really, really incredible, but you have to go for big ideas. Okay. Um, another thing is 77% of the best companies, so there are 40,000 startups roughly that are venture back in the United States, only 0.3% of them are really good thing and of those companies 70% of them go public so if you want to do something really big you have to kind of think okay in 7 to 12 years from the point that I started my business I'm going to be a public company CEO that is the definition that is the line from A to B of doing something big now there's nothing wrong with saying hey listen I want to like hang out in my house and do plenty of fish and create this cool dating thing and make a million bucks a year and not worked awesome for him. So for different lifestyle kinds of businesses, I'm just talking about if you want to do something big, that's what it looks like. Um, here's um, uh, one of the Canadian challenges, I think. So um, there's an interesting uh, thing when um, Bezos started because it was the biggest goddamn river on the planet and he was going to build the biggest goddamn company on the planet. That ambition started in 1994. Now in Canadian speak, um, far too often our best companies, and this was one of the best companies of its generation, we would have sold it, that's why I have a little Canadian flag for sale sign. Um, <laughs> you know, we would have sold it in 1997, woohoo! All right, we sold it for 400 million, we win! You know, then we would have sold it again in 1999, whoa, it's worth a billion dollars! Woohoo! Let's sell it. All right. Uh, we would have sold it in 2001. Oh my God! The internet crashed and everything's going to hell. Like, let's sell before it all goes to hell. You know, we sold it again. You know, and guess what? Like, this company didn't even get interesting until 2013. Didn't have its first profit. Did not have its first profit until 2001 when it got to a billion in revenue. And the point here is, why would you have a profit? when you see this big line up above, which is Walmart, and that company was built on something called Interstate Highway, which is getting completely destroyed by this thing called the internet. So his, his vision is, I'm gonna like take Walmart out, and look how goddamn big that is. I'm gonna go after it, and I'm gonna take him out, and I'm gonna invest all the money I can to make that happen. So this, like, let's get our business profitable in 24 months. You can do that, but you will never build anything really, truly big and disruptive if you do that. All right. 
So a lot of cool people up here that have this flavor of going after the ball. A lot of cool people have the same flavor going after the ball. You know everybody on the top row, I assume. Does everyone know everybody on the bottom row? Um, a couple of favorite ones for Li Jun, who started Xiaomi, um, that's gone from zero to $10 billion in revenue in five years. Zero to $10 billion in revenue in five years. The biggest, fastest growing private company on the planet. Um, Jack Dorsey in his uh, earlier punk uh, state down in the lower right, uh, founder of two billion revenue companies, actually CEO of two billion dollar revenue companies. So if you think you're busy, you know, like try to be CEO of two fast growing companies. Um, uh, Elon Musk uh, went to Queen's University as an engineer, lots of Canadian connections. I, I guess the, um, the other thing that I point out to you guys um, though is any one of those guys up there could be you guys or vice versa. Jack was a kid from St. Louis. Folks owned a pizza shop. You know, just weird, crazy fascination, like going after the dog ball on some things. He is the startup that is Twitter completely failed, which is audio, which was a podcasting company. And the idea was birthed on a swing set in San Francisco for Twitter. Um, Stuart, a Canadian from Vancouver, did Flickr now CEO uh, and founder of Slack. Both Flickr and Slack were birthed out of companies where the initial idea failed. Um, everyone know the next guy right beside Stuart, hopefully? Toby, our rock star right now. Um, love Toby. I remember sitting in the market in Ottawa with him when we were starting C100 five years ago. And it was clear, like you just like, he has that look in his eyes like that, I am going to go crush it. Like just unbelievably focused, determined, I'm gonna go build an amazing company and everything else is going to like just be destroyed by the direction that I'm gonna make it happen. But in a very level, somewhat dramatic, uh, somewhat frightening, uh, which the other thing, like all these people have a little bit fright, if you look at their eyes, they're a little bit frightening human beings. Um, <laughs> apparently you need to have that um, as well. But one of the things I said to Toby is, you will not be successful with your startup in Ottawa unless you engage your community in Ottawa and make your community successful. Because if there's no community around you, your company, which is rooted in that soil, will not get the needs to be successful. They put it back on the map after it was dead out, you know, um, completely, and changed the way it meant to do a startup in Ottawa. You know, I used to do these things, like my startups in Ottawa, like you have like these horribly brown carpets with coffee stains in Canada, and you'd be locked in there all winter, and you know, occasionally they let you out for one beer. Um, you go to Shopify's headquarters in downtown Ottawa, I mean, you could not, think of anything so different than what those environments and those cultures were in Canada versus the culture that they're creating uh, now in Ottawa, which I think is so, so an important thing. Um, Terry Matthews, who I did Newbridge Networks with, the only Canadian entrepreneur um, that I know of who built two companies to over a billion in revenue. Um, so one of our, our Hall of Famers and still, I just got an email from him two days ago, still doing more startups and investing in young people and doing awesome things. Uh, actually invited Angela and I out to his cottage to go hang out with 10 startups he thinks are really cool. Um, anyone know who the guy on the middle row left is? Garrett Camp. Camp. Wow, yes, excited, all right. You're, you're winning the bingo game on like, <laughs> who are cool entrepreneurs that I need to be thinking about, learning from. Uh, uh, Garrett Camp from Calgary, uh, the founder of Uber was drunk um, south of market and couldn't get a cab and wanted to go home and looked at his phone and said, wouldn't it be cool if, right? Um, it's also started stumble upon, sold it, re-managing re it. Um, really, really amazing Canadian entrepreneur. The point of all of this is the ball and going after something big, you know, because you only have so much time. 
Um, so way too often as Canadian entrepreneurs, we're happy to be at the Olympics carrying the flag. Yay, we made it. We're at the Olympics. Can I be the flag bearer? Woohoo! Success, you know? Um, and that's okay, but you know what's more awesome? Haley. Haley's fucking awesome. Haley grew up in a small town in Saskatchewan. She played boys hockey till the time she was 13. She is the best hockey player on the planet. I met Haley for the first time in 2012 in Salt Lake. They had lost to the Americans every single game coming up to the Olympics. And Haley like just put the whole team on her back, said we are gonna win the goddamn gold medal. And guess what? They won the gold medal. And then what did, she, what did Haley do? She won it again four years later. Then she won it again four years later. Then she won it again four years later. Never happened in history. She is an absolute hero, an absolute rock star, and she chases that dog ball like nobody's business. Kid from Saskatchewan, best goddamn hockey player on the planet. Um, and you could do that if you focus on it, but can you go back one slide? If your goal, if your objective is to go to the Olympics and carry the flag, you will never achieve anything more than that. What you set up as your goal will determine your outcome. If your goal is, next slide, to win the gold medal, then go look at the people that won gold medals before you and learn what it took to get from here to there. Because I can guarantee you nobody's worked harder longer at being an amazing hockey player than this woman. Um, one last tidbit. We'll go to next slide. So this is from um, Jack Dorsey. One thing I'd encourage you to do, you may not choose to use it after this, but like, you know, pull out your phone, pull up the little notepad, you know, on your phone and have two things you put on a note. Do, don't. And while you're here for 48 hours, write down the things that you want to do and write down the things you don't want to do. Uh, build what you want to see in the world. Uh, that, that came from a, a good friend. Trust the gut. Um, not, often not done, uh, especially as it relates to people. Like if, if you feel like your team's not quite working or if there is an individual who's not quite fitting in the role to really drive your company, I can guarantee you they were the wrong person four months ago. Trust your gut, act on it, move quickly. Um, only surround yourself with great people like no assholes, like life is way too short to have any assholes anywhere near you. That means investors, that means lawyers, that means people on your team because it will infect your company like a cancer, it will destroy you, it will drain you mentally. Only have great people around you. Um, be trans um, do Friday stand-ups. Tell your entire team, like what are the biggest things you're worried about, right? Because if they feel like you're engaged with them, you're gonna get so much more out of the people you're working with. You're gonna get so many better ideas. You'll get stuff done faster. So I think transparency is one of the number one things that the Valley has most better than other places on the planet and really engaging people and human capital to uh, accomplish cool things. Um, take risks and fail. Also often said, often the risks we take are not big enough. And it doesn't really take you to that hairy edge of failure. So really push yourself, like what are the really big things that I could do to completely change the trajectory of what I'm working on? And if it screws up, what am I gonna learn from it? Like tell yourself that, like there's a good chance it's not gonna work. I just told you like 40,000 startups in the US, only 0.3%, 450 of them actually get through that, you know, amazing, hazing top funnel of making something big. And the only way you get there is by taking big risks. You will never get there by taking small risks. I can guarantee you. Um, don't be a douchebag. Um, I took this from Chamath, uh, who's another great Canadian uh, who was very early, early at Facebook and really figured out growth hacking. Um, Chamas, a really amazing human being, he, I think, in a really great way, takes one of the amazing assets we have as Canadians, which is 
the humility and being engaging in this brand of Canada is actually a really, really powerful thing here in the Valley. Um, and so, you know, the keep doing that because it matters to everyone in the room that we individually don't be douchebags because that wrecks our whole brand for everybody. So like, you know, you are carrying the flag. You may not realize you're carrying the flag, but the flag is tattooed on the back of your backpack or on your back. So be really awesome because there are this really amazing group of people that are coming behind you and help them out. Um, most of these things you know, time is more valuable than money. Time is so much more valuable than money. All right, cool. That's it. <laughs> Build something awesome. Go find your, go find your ball. I'm okay. Yes. All right. Hey, Sukinder. <laughs> How about a bit of time for question and answer? Yeah. So Kinder is like Haley, by the way. You you're gonna like love a conversation with her. She's amazing. She's like she's got four. So Kinder's got at least four gold medals on her wall. So. Um, any questions about that? I know it's kind of a lot to throw at you guys. Yeah. And then also the, you know, the Amazon example of just reinvesting, reinvesting so that you're not getting profits. It's a hard sell when you're trying to raise money because they want to see that, that you are actually going to have some revenues there, some profits there, not just revenue but profits. So could you address that? So um, it's a great question. Um, and it's all about do you want to be the flag bearer or do you want to have the gold medal? Because if you want to be the flag bearer, you will surround yourself with people that get you to that goal. And the investors that you get, they'll be like, oh yeah, if we go to the Olympics and be the flag bearer, that would be awesome. Woohoo, we win. Yeah, we're in and out in five years. You know, you know, we sell the company for $125 million. We put like 10 million in. That's like good math for us. And that's what we know how to do. But if you want to be Haley and you want to win the gold medal, you got to like, okay, I can't be partners with those people. And that's really your investors are probably the biggest hiring decision you will ever make because you cannot get rid of them. Um, so know who you bring into your company, know who you're partners with. If you want to win the gold medal, you have got to find the people that aspire to go after that opportunity. And it's not to say either one's right or wrong, but like set your goal, make sure you have the people around you to get that goal. Um, because you will have investors that say, yeah, let's put $10 million in, let's get it profitable in 36 months, let's not burn any cash, and when we get the business to $20 million in revenue, we'll sell it for $110 million, and that is awesome. And that, unfortunately, happens far too much in Canadian venture firms. Why? Because they haven't made money in a decade. For them to raise more money, they have to show that they can make money, which means they have to raise money every four years so what do they have to do every four years? They have to sell something to show their investors that they know how to make money. What's the easiest thing to sell? One of your best companies for a low price. So you have to be very careful about what's upstream of the capital you take. Why are they motivated in a certain way? What are they trying to accomplish? What drives their business? Now there are some amazing Canadian venture firms and angels that take a very different perspective which is they want the gold medal. They want Haley, they want Shopify, they want to build build direct, they want to build with. Um, so that, I guess, partially answers that question, hopefully. Any other questions? Yeah, Chris, yeah. Um, just about the culture of failure and how it's celebrated here, is that changing in Canada at all? Uh, yes, but not fast enough. I don't know, I should ask you guys, you could turn around. Okay, who, who thinks that if you fail in Canada, um, it is a mark of badness? Put your hands up. Okay, and who thinks it's a, hey, they tried something, they really took some risks, they learned some shit, that's cool, I'm really excited to see what they're gonna do next, because guess what, you know, Stuart like, failed 
on his first idea and created Flickr, and then he failed on his first idea and created Slack. Who like thinks that's sort of like the sentiment in Canada? Okay, there's your answer. Not not yet. <laughs> not yet. I think everyone in this room believes that failing is is, is a good learning, learning, but the culture is still there. Uh, yeah, it is changing. Like you you can I can feel it. I can feel it differently in different communities too. Like Waterloo, I think they're like much more wired into the valley culture than what I feel in Omni. Like, you guys are the change you want in the world. Like, just decide to make it different. Because this cohort and the other cohorts acting together, you are the leaders of the best. By definition, this is the golden ticket. This is the hardest ticket to get in Canada. You are the best startups Canada has, cumulatively the cohorts. Your environment, same message I gave to Toby and Harley. So like, I can't change your environment sitting in San Francisco. You know, I show up in Ottawa, you know, twice a year, three times a year. You know, you're the ones that are in the community. You're going to the beers, you know, every Friday night. You're the ones that have to kind of change the way you do startups in Ottawa. I found myself at 25 billion. Really, I'm going to win the next four consecutive games. YouTube of Haley, you know, like some really interesting interviews there. Like, she played boys hockey until she was 13. Like, her objective was to be the best hockey player in the world, irrespective of gender. So she wanted to go play where the best hockey was being played at her age, right? And so there was like steps along the way, but the end goal was really clear. She wanted to be the best hockey player in the world, and she became the best hockey player in the world. So what is the ball? What is the space? Don't, don't focus so much on the billion dollar in revenue. Talk about dominating a space and talk about why that space is big and important and start to talk about the baby steps between how do I dominate that space from here to there and how those connect and then just show like the I've ripped that soccer ball to pieces 40 ways a Sunday Nobody knows the space better than me. Nobody knows the competitors better than me. Nobody knows the cost structure better than me. Like, there's a great story about, um, you know, Airbnb, you know, before that. Who would have thought you could say, okay, I'm going to go destroy the hotel business? Or whoever thought Garrett's idea of destroying transportation, as we, we knew it, would come out of being drunk in South of Market. But, um, so the idea has to be big, your passion and knowledge of the space has to be encyclopedic. Like you, there, there needs to be nobody smarter on your space in the world than you. That's really, really important. And then the steps and the work that you do needs to be somewhat tangible. Like I'm going to go 13 year old, you know, minor perspective of gender, which Haley was. Um, yeah. Here's just on that point as well. Yeah, Chris is, Chris is awesome. He decided to be an astronaut when Canada didn't even have a program right. for astronauts, right? Like, so talk about like what you want it to be to achieve. Um, um, that was amazing, right? The, and I, I, wouldn't, I would feel bad if there was any other speaker coming up other than I've seen Sue Kinder speak before. And uh, she's, she's one of the only it. ones that can follow up. You have two because we're doing live. So Sukinder. Yep. Finn. All right. Sorry to be late this morning, but you had Chris Albinson instead, which is much better. I gave up in Whistler called Diary of a CEO, which is really thinking about scaling yourself and your teams. Uh, by way of background, I'm from St. Catharines, Ontario. So my uh, sister lives in Brampton. My husband's from Vancouver. Uh, we've been down in Silicon. My first startup, which is a company called Yodely in financial services software. Uh, I was the business founder there and just went public. Uh, 
this past year, which is uh, a long time to exit, but great to see. Um, and then I left Yodely after running sales and BD there um, at five years, and I went to Google for six years, where I was the first GM of local and maps, and then I ultimately was president of APAC in LATAM. So I ran uh, a big portion of our international operations for about six years. And then I left Google, I spent some time at Excel as a CEO in residence thinking about what I wanted to do next. It's for fashion, it was like running 18 different startups because every country CEO thought their country was the center of the universe. And when we started that business, it was about, or when I took that business, it was about 60 million. And when I finished, it was about 2 billion. And so we went through kind of rapid scale in every different market, some very challenged like China, and some were, quite frankly, everything went right, like Australia. Um, but in between, you know, we had, I had to run many different things at once. Um, so with that, let's get started. So the first thing I want to talk to you all about, how many of you in here are the founder of your own companies? How many of you are CEO? Okay, a few, and the rest, I mean, are dealing with the CEO, right? But um, in some ways, it doesn't matter, because what I'm going to talk about is a paradigm for leadership that applies to both the founders and the CEO. Um, so the first thing I want to talk, uh, talk about is the conventional wisdom on leadership and management in the valley and, and why I think it's wrong, right? So if you look down at the bottom right, there's the characteristics of the founder. Entrepreneurial, in the details, designing the product, knows every feature, knows what features should be built next. And then there's the CEO up and to the right. And that CEO is responsible for board management and vision and recruiting executives and all of those competencies, right? And this is the way people sort of paint the picture. But if you, um, but if you think about it, my own mental model is fundamentally different. And I think this is important for all of you who are founders in the CEO seat, for the who are founders who gave up the CEO seat, for those who are in the CEO seat and hope to stay in the CEO seat as the company scales. You know, I think that the problem with that model is it's sort of out of date, right? This notion that there's one and there's the other and there's this classic marriage. You know, I'm much more a fan of sort of the Tim Cook, you know, style of operating, which is really how do you be both, even if you're not good at both, right? And, and for me, it's much more like this. It's about a CEO's job is to move left to right, you know, between his sort of executive capacity and entrepreneurial capacity, whatever is required from that company at that time, and meanwhile, up and down, right, like in sine waves. So this notion that you are somebody who only knows the details or only knows the structure is a misnomer, right? Because at any point in time, you know, the best executives I've ever seen, whether they're running a startup or, quite frankly, running a division at Google, can do both. They can do both. They know when to be in the forest, when at any point in time I can find to figure out this issue. Or this issue is uniquely mine to figure out. If I can't figure it out, we have a problem. You know, and sometimes, sadly, architect the answer yourself, even though you wish that you were that Jack Welsh type CEO who could just lead everybody else to vision. You know, and so how to know when to do what is, I think, the fundamental thing that distinguishes great executives from not so great ones, right? And founders and CEOs, founder CEOs who are capable of staying in that seat, I think it's often because they know how to exercise this judgment, even though they are not great at everything on this, on this page. But they know how to be good enough, and they know where to recruit for what they're not good at, and they know what hat they need to put on at any point in time. And that instinct is, I think, what defines a great operator, whether you're running uh, something big or something small. Um, so so if, if you're that person, how do you think about that journey, right? How do you think about, OK, well, you know, can, am I capable of this or not? The obvious first answer is, what are you great at? Get all of you in the room and ask you, like, what's your trademark strength? How many of you could put up your hand right now and bring me the two words that describe the essence of who you are and what you lead from? How many of you know your trademark strength? Really, only one person in the room? Two, three, four? It's okay, you're not alone. Every time I ask this question, or if it's CEOs I'm talking to, executives, entrepreneurs, MBAs, thing. If you don't, there's no shoppable player on YouTube, you know, like the morass is endless. Joyous is so complex, okay? There's so many days I wish I had a one trick pony. So many days I wish like, oh, I wish that for this company to be a home run, I only need to get one thing right, right? 
the reality at Joyous is I need to get six things right at the same time. Right? And by the way, there are many days I wake up cursing myself a bit about that. But I also know that inherently, and the last thing was capital, because when you're trying to build out both an e-commerce company and a content company at the same time, you know, trust me, it takes a lot of capital, premium content, not user generated. And so when I sort of put Joyce together, part of me was like, wow, this is really hard. And the other part of me is like, okay, what is my unique skill set, right? I know general management, I know biz dev, I know just about enough about product to be dangerous, and I can recruit, right? And those things line up very, and I can raise capital. And those things line up very naturally with the barriers to entry for my business, right? So there are days I curse myself for being so complex, but there are other days I feel like, you know, there won't be four engines. So I choose, choose to look at the world and say, okay, if anybody can bring that together, it's me. I still may not get it done, but I know that I have that, and that's what this business plan requires to succeed, right? And I didn't pick something that, quite frankly, required only the architecting of a great product, right? which quite frankly I know enough about, but I'm not going to be the person who builds a platform that competes with YouTube's first company, um, and she's a double CS from Stanford. That's great. But as the founder, right, I had to basically figure out what I'm good at, what I'm good at, enough to know whether or not this company and this vision align to that, and I could be a unique asset into that company. And the number two, I had to go recruit myself, right, somebody, somebody really, the last, I mean, the first person who told me my trademark strengths was like my high school teacher. Um, and it was enlightening for me to understand that. So um, if, you, if you leave with nothing else today, anchor yourself in what your trademark strength is and know it. And if you don't know it, you've got to go ask and figure it out. Ask your board, ask your employees, ask your spouse, ask your best friends. And I guarantee one or two, three, four, uh, you know, is the words they use to describe you. Um, so, of course, if you think about the notion that you're likely to be good at one or two things uniquely, right? Maybe more, that's awesome, but you know, one or two things uniquely. You look at that grid and you look at what your company is, and it probably also identifies for you what you're not good at and what you need, right? I always say to CEOs and even founders, but CEOs um, most of all, I mean both, probably if you're not spending 50% of your time recruiting, I don't know what you're doing. Job is to, right. I spend, you guys know this, like you're caught up in a problem, you keep trying to solve the problem, you know the answer to solving the problem is the right person, but stopping to solve the, find the right person takes time. Some people hate recruiting because it requires you to sell, sell, sell. Um, in the case of startups, it often requires you to cold call. You know, I get on LinkedIn a lot and look for the people who might be the people I know. And I don't leave it to a recruiter. Even if I could, like I don't. That doesn't mean that recruiters don't help us, but at the end of the day, like, this is my company, right? And this, so I spend more than 50% of my time recruiting, right? Of course, like the very earliest of stages, I understand that it's about prototyping and getting a product at the door and figuring out if you have something work. Using the fact that you are the founder or the CEO, people will respond to you, even if they don't know who you are by virtue of your title. True, right? I, I say to my engineering team all the time, I'm like, okay, who are you guys trying to close right now? What can I do to help you close this candidate? You know, and I get frustrated if we lose a candidate. It'll always, be, I mean, including in the valley, right? This perfect candidate. You almost, but frankly, they choose enough that I nice to not in. And unlike uh, or some churn, come back with a great can think about what your strategy is to go work on a problem substantively enough that it's a meaty problem and with the bounds around it, right? And then at what point do they show it back to you? And these are actually really important things. I mean, for us, like deliberately adopt these tactics for me to be able to scale. The if I don't force their adoption, I'll say to people, okay, if you walk in a room and there's, there's two points of view, no point of view and my point of view, what do you think you're going to walk out with? So do not walk into a meeting with me without a point of view. Like, if it takes you three seconds of, like, okay, we can do that. Like, I can tell you what's going to happen at the end of this process. And by the way, I feel good. Like, I got my opinions out there, right? Like, hey, we left with my agenda. What's wrong with that? But it doesn't serve the executive opinionated person, which a lot of founders and a lot of CEOs are, 
what is the construct you need to deliberately create for your team to be able to co-create? Next slide, please. Um, which comes back to my next point. I always say to people, you manage me or I manage you. What would you prefer? And I say this in actually in seriousness because it is very, um, it's very, right? The challenge with that is it's not that fun for me and it's not that fun for you. And actually, I say to people all the time, I am not a good manager. I'm just not. I'm a good leader of like already highly talented people. So I'd rather work on recruiting the most highly talented person and leading them versus managing people, which I find if I know that I'm much more of the sort of, I can sort of lead and inspire. But really what I like to do is to be able to like recruit really smart people and have them author enough, give them insight. A whole, not only is it not detail level, it also makes it important that we all have them, right? That is your job. You got to come in every day and for the people who are draining your energy, you're managing other people's agendas, you're doing something else like running your company. It is entirely true. But if there's ever a place to be heads up, particularly as a founder or CEO in a startup with a board who, quite frankly, probably doesn't give you a regular performance review. Any of your boards give you a regular performance review? Shocking, right? Shocking. I mean, just shocking. Just for a moment, think about that. You've all been in large companies where you got the benefit of a regular review. You're now running your own company with capital, and they give you a formal performance review. If you do nothing else, go ask your annual review. Because if they have something to tell you about how you're performing, you'd rather they're actually objective and run a transparent to figure out what that is rather than letting it be the anecdotes for the five times a year they're in the room with you. Like, right? But conversely, this is what I'm like, of an, all the areas to manage, you need to manage your board. Absolutely true. So if there's one place up versus head down, building your, it is your board. Company, it's anecdotes. It's their opinion of what's happening in the product side. It's their opinion that things are going too slow. Um, Sometimes ill-formed, sometimes well-formed. So I think the area you all have to be politically astute. And people think there are no politics in a small company. Of course there are politics in a small company. Whenever you have a lot of people who have their own agendas who care, whether, you know, this does mean that forcing the team on to step back, this is it. Number one, Andrew Preet. Who is your board having dual agenda? He is paid to live. not saying that they are not startup, typical of ourselves. Like, but claiming it, you know, is part of helping people understand what you are and what you're not, and trying to be the best version of what you are, right? So yeah, we have a lot of risk in our account, in our culture because of that same intensity. But it's named, it's spoken, we talk about it in a way we didn't four years ago, right? And we sort of pay people coming in through the door, like this is who it's good for and this is who it's really not good for. We just started doing an NPS with our with our employees, you know, because I wanted to understand like how do they feel about the culture and would they recommend it. And some of the feedback that came back is like, I love Joyous. But actually, I'm not sure I would recommend it to everyone because it's not for everyone. And I was like, yeah, you know, that's a fine answer. Like, there's nothing wrong with that answer. If you think that some people won't survive this culture, that's right. So, I mean, I think it's, I think um, claiming your religion is as important as finding your priest. And so, the last thing I want to leave you with is sort of as we think about that original principle of sort of like that model for growth, what I call operating range, and think about left, right, top, down. You know. I think the key principle I want to leave with you is like your job here is to draft, right? Often as a CEO, if you and uh, we'll see you back here in ten.